Benjamin is sponsored to us. Thank you so much for you're being here well. today. Um, I'm very me. happy that you're here, and I'm very happy that you came all the way from Los Angeles, even though you came via Wales, or you started in Wales. You're a, a Welsh... Um, yes, I'm a Welshman. Welsh man, but you've Welshman. been in, the, in Los Angeles for quite a while, right? Yes, yeah. Um, how did you get from Wales to Los Angeles? Um, well, originally I flew. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. You didn't take the train? No, I didn't take the boat, no. no. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I, I was signed to a, a record company over there, so that was an easy way of getting a visa. Um, and uh, when you went over there, you mean you've worked with so many people. Um, did you start? Uh, did, did you were you famous before you went to LA, or I'm do you feel famous? famous? You don't feel famous? No, no, I think you not. are. Well, thank you. I feel famous on this show. Yeah, you yeah, should. Yeah. We've watched by millions of people. Yeah, well. we are. Um, when they, when you uh, you worked with a lot of people, so yes. um, how did you you know you they signed you over there to go to LA? But was it a big step for you? Do you think oh do I really want to leave Europe and go to LA? Um, yeah, it was it was a kind of a, a natural progression really. I was mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of songwriting for other people and and session musician stuff, playing guitar for other people. Um, and then Warner offered me a deal as a songwriter, um, and I was given the option to either sign from the London office or in Los Angeles, so I chose the Los Angeles office and decided that a change is as good as a rest, basically. Um, ich, I'll try and translate a little yeah, bit. Yeah, please um, do. Also, damals uh, konnte er sich entscheiden von der Plattenfirma, ob er jetzt uh, in Europa bleibt oder nach L.A. geht. Und dann hat er gesagt, ich glaube, ich äh, probiere das mal aus. Er hat schon mit vielen, vielen Leuten zusammengearbeitet, äh, war zum Beispiel auch mit Chris Isaac auf Tour. Und das werde ich ihn gleich mal dazu befragen. You were on tour with Chris Isaac. Oh, uh, that was the last time I was in Germany, Yeah, I think, that was yeah. 2010, was it? Uh, 2012, 12, 12, oh, okay, 2012, 12, 2012, end of 2012. Yes. So that's actually not, not that long ago. No, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't. But now you're back by yourself or yes. are you touring with someone else? No, doing my own thing this time. Um, how is it when you're working with somebody like Chris Isaac and who says, you know, I, I want to do it this way and you think, I want to do it a different way? <laughs> um, I think these days as a musician, you can't be too too picky. You kind of got to go with the money, yes. Because <laughs> really? there's so little around. You yeah. know? So if somebody says, yeah, I want to do the show and I want you to do it solo acoustic or whatever it is, then you kind of go, yeah, I'll do that. And um, how was it working with, with him? It was great. Oh, yeah. yeah, we hung out a lot and he was, yeah, he's a really funny guy. Really? Yeah, yeah he's hilarious. Yeah. But you've also done a lot of other things for other people. You've yes. Worked with, who, have, who are the people you've worked with and, and um, how have they influenced your Ooh. own work? My own work? Um, I've worked with, I've toured with Joe Cocker, Chris Cornell, um, done stuff for The Who. Um, Todd Rundgren was a big influence, to be honest, touring with him and working with him. Him. And why? Just because I've always respected his work and he's one of those artists that has managed to have a career without ever really kind of he's kind of kind of been under the radar a little bit and not mm -hmm. a lot of people know who he is, you know. And they certainly don't know that he produced Bat Out of Hell, you know, and stuff like that. So I've always had, I always had a kind of huge respect for him. Also er hat mit Leuten wie Joe Cocker zum Beispiel gearbeitet, auch mit Todd Rundgren, der ist, ähm, derjenige, der Battle of Hell von Meatloaf produziert hat und äh, das muss man erst wissen. But I must say, when, uh, since I've, I've done quite a lot of interviews, I've met, met a lot of people, I'm, the really famous people are the ones that are kind of the most relaxed and the, the most easy to go along with. What from that kind of characteristic have you taken for yourself to um. use like... On, in your musical career? I think, yeah, I mean, the, first of all, I think it comes from my parents because they raised okay. me not to be an idiot. You know, I hope <laughs> that's still intact. Um, but, yeah, I think that I think you're absolutely right. The more famous people tend to get or the more successful they tend to get, the more humility they have. It's the people that are, you know, fighting for it and struggling and not quite comfortable with themselves enough. I think that kind of the negative sides of their personality shine through a little bit more often, you know. Um, also, er, ich habe ihn gerade gefragt, wenn man mit solchen Leuten arbeitet wie Joe Cocker, die sehr, sehr berühmt sind, ähm, die scheinen aber sehr einfach sein zum Arbeiten, äh, weil sie so ein bisschen äh, zurück, sich zurückhalten und sehr ähm, laid back sind, sage ich mal. Und er hat gesagt, ja, das stimmt ähm, und man sollte sich eine Schei Scheibe davon abschneiden als Künstler und ne eben äh, ganz entspannt umgehen äh, mit der Welt und, äh, und nicht sich zu wichtig nehmen. Oh, aber er sagt, es war nicht immer nicht Joe Cocker, sondern seine Eltern, die ihn so erzogen haben. Um, I see you laughing. Do you speak a little bit? Of German, do you understand what uh, I'm saying? I, right? I, there's a couple of words that I, I can pick up. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go back to the the real roots. Your yes. parents. Did, yes. Were they the ones who said, you know what, we think you're talented. You should learn an instrument. Or did you say I want to learn an instrument? Or did, did they I, have nothing to do with it? I yeah. found the instrument first. Guitar was found in a bin, in a skip like a rubbish bin really? uh, when I was yeah about 10 years old uh, um, so I it kind who throws of, away a guitar? Uh, yeah I don't know somebody was clearing out a house and it was just sitting on the top so I grabbed it mm -hmm. 
um, and tried to learn it, but didn't realize at the time that guitars are supposed to have six strings and this one had four. Really? So I was trying <laughs> to learn this four string guitar. And then about six months later, Christmas came around and my grandparents and my parents kind of clubbed together and bought me a guitar that was too big for me. But until then, you... Nobody told you that you shouldn't no. be playing on four strings no, no, for six months. You yeah, played on I was it. Yeah, just kind of. I think. I think my dad. Well, my dad obviously knew because he's a huge music fan, and he was probably the biggest influence in, in me being a musician. Um, but yeah, up until that point, I think he was just like, ah, oh, maybe it's just a phase, and he's just enjoying. I was mm -hmm. just trying to make a noise out of it, really. And it wasn't until I got the six strings that I was like, oh, this is what it's supposed to sound like. Also, als er zehn war ungefähr, um, ist er im Haus vorbeigegangen, was leer geräumt wurde, und irgendjemand hat eine Gitarre weggeschmissen. Die hat er sich dann gekreidet und hat sechs Monate lang gespielt. Keiner hat ihm mitgeteilt, dass er eigentlich uh, sechs uh, Strings, uh, sechs. Uh, wie? Seiten, danke. Sechs Seiten äh, braucht und, äh, und hat halt mit vier geübt. Ähm, und dann hat er zu Weihnachten von seinen Eltern und seinen Großeltern eine Gitarre geschenkt bekommen, weil sie gesehen haben, aha, das ist jetzt nicht einfach eine Sache, die schnell vorbeigeht, sondern äh, das wird er machen. So, how long did it take for you to realize, after you had the six string guitar, <lacht> that uh, you were talented and that you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? Um, I was 12 when I went to see Paul McCartney and that was the thing that was a real catalyst for me. I was like, oh, this is definitely a, something I, I want to do. I think he was doing Live and Let Die and the fireworks went off and I went, oh yeah, now But I'm into it. Was it more because of the music or more because of the fireworks and you thought, I want to be on stage, I want it was, to be it was the this? It was, the, it was the performance <laughs> and it was the music. It was with 100% it was always the music. Because I, I, I started writing songs where, as soon as I knew three or four chords, I started to write my own stuff. Um, so I think that the goal for me was always to just try and write songs and if other people heard them then great but it was always just for me and my parents were getting divorced around that time so I think that was it was quite therapeutic for me it's funny how sometimes those kind of things in your life make you be able to write really really good songs which is kind of unfortunate but on the other hand it's it can totally, be fortunate yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also er war zwölf als er gesagt hat ich werde Musiker werden da hat er Paul McCartney live auf der Bühne gesehen der Live and Die gespielt und dann ging die Feuerwerk los und dann hat er gesagt nicht nur das Feuerwerk sondern auch die Musik die führen dazu dass ich unbedingt Musiker werden soll und damit hat er auch schon seine ersten Songs geschrieben, auch in der Zeit, als seine Eltern sich scheiden lassen haben. Und das sind ja eben Momente im Leben, die einen dazu bringen, so vielleicht ein bisschen kreativer zu sein. Leider, aber so ist es halt. Some of the bad things turn into good things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you think about your first performance on stage for where you got, that, that you got paid for, um, first of all, where was it? And second of all, what did you do with the money that you got paid? That's a good question. Uh, the first one was um, the Dinnywick's Pub in um, Gloucestershire, which is... Been uh, there. Yeah, you have? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's really nice. It's really pretty. Yeah, yeah you've been there. I don't know whether you probably haven't been to the actual Dinny Wicks, so. though. Maybe you have. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I a, have, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've totally been <laughs> yeah. there. Um, it was... Uh, I did a solo acoustic thing um, for the landlord. I did a weekly thing, and they paid me 50 pounds a week and oh, all wow. the beer I could drink, and I was 15. <laughs> my, all my Is friends that legal? had yeah, I, no, it wasn't legal at all. <laughs> all my friends had paper rounds, and I was doing that on a Friday night, like singing covers of like Beatles songs That's and stuff like that. That's probably the best gig you'll ever get, actually. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I know. I'm still trying to get back to it. Yeah. Also, sein äh, erster äh, Auftritt, für den er auch bezahlt worden ist, äh, war eigentlich ein Auftritt nicht nur eins, sondern mehrere Auftritte. Da äh, konnte er in einem Pug, Pub. What's it called again? It was called the Dinny Wicks. The Dinny Wicks. Da hat er gespielt yeah. und hat pro Woche 50 Pfund bekommen. Aber das allerbeste war, er konnte so viel Bier trinken, wie er wollte, und das mit fünf. 15 um, ist, glaube ich, das Beste, was man haben kann. Um, yeah, I think it probably is the best gig, but I do yeah. wish you lots of <laughs> other gigs, and you're going to be playing here as well. We're going to um, show while well you're getting ready to play yes. the next song. Okay. We're going to show The Promise live. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember where this was performed? This was done uh, at the Vo uh, Volva Live in Holland. Mm -hmm. um, it's a recording studio that people can come and watch you play, and they record the whole show live, almost like a, an old kind of MTV unplugged kind that of sounds thing. Sounds good. Yeah, it it's almost really like fun. our show. Is it a lot like yeah. your show? Yeah. Um, speaking of which, is there one one place that you played in uh, that was like you know all over the world you've played, but are the Americans kind of different than the Europeans? Yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you know America, so you get into the Midwest and people get very excited when you show up because they don't get a lot of... They don't get people around yeah, them, They don't get yeah. people around them. But, you know, and the coasts are a little bit more jaded, so... I'm not going to translate that because I'll get yeah. in trouble with my relatives. <laughs> anyway, uh, Paul Freeman uh, ist bei uns zu Gast. Er wird gleich auch spielen. Wir werden ihn jetzt gleich hier eben aus, in diesem Video sehen und uh, da wird er sich vorbereiten. Also lehnt euch zurück und hört zu bei The Promise und dann gibt es gleich noch ein bisschen mehr von ihm live hier im Studio.